come to order. For far too long, our policy around China catered to multinational corporations and failed working families. It destroyed local communities. It eroded our manufacturing base and our national competitiveness. Shouldn't be news to anyone. It's why 23 years ago, uh, then Congressman Lindsey Graham and I opposed more permanent normal trade relations with China. We knew that corporations, we knew that corporations would shut down production in Ohio and South Carolina and across the country and move production to China in search of lower and lower wages. It's exactly what happened. Since NAFTA's enactment in 1994 and China's entry into the World Trade Organization, Ohio has lost at least 275,000 manufacturing jobs. That's over a quarter of a million Ohioans who once had a good paying job, usually with top notch benefits that comes with a union card, suddenly finding themselves out of a job. It often takes a decade or more for families and communities to recover from that kind of loss. It devastated industrial communities in Ohio and around the country, and it helped build up the Chinese military. Today, after years of misguided China policy, we're finally starting to do something about it. We passed landmark legislation to rebuild our infrastructure and invest in critical technologies like semiconductors and advanced energy that will build more secure supply chains. Ohio will be at the center of that kind of investment. Finally, we buried the term Rust Belt. Now we're finally making more in America. We need to safeguard critical technology from PRC's military and security apparatus using national security measures. It's why we're holding this hearing. For years, this committee's worked on a bipartisan basis to establish legal authorities to protect our national security from risks posed by the Chinese Communist Party. Five years ago, I worked with then Chair Crapo to pass the Export Control Reform Act and the Foreign Investment Risk Review and Modernization Act. We strengthened our export control system and inbound investment screening authorities. Last month, we did it again. Ranking Member Scott and I worked with the majority of this committee to introduce the Fend Off Fentanyl Act. We've nearly all of the committee members, almost half the Senate is co-sponsors. 2021, fentanyl was involved in 80% 80 percent of Ohio's unintentional drug overdose deaths. Over and over, I hear from Ohioans that we need new, new more powerful tools to prevent the flow of fentanyl into our communities. Our bill declares that international fentanyl trafficking is a national emergency, an emergency that destroys lives and families across our country and that poses an extraordinary threat to the national security, the foreign policy, and the economy of our country. Therefore, the bill uses our economic arsenal to target every step, every step of the foreign supply chain, from Chinese chemical suppliers to Mexican cartels to money laundering, prof money launderers profiting off the illicit drug trade. National security threats evolve, whether from regimes in Tehran or Pyongyang or Moscow or Beijing or non-state actors or human rights abuse, abuses, IP theft, illicit fentanyl trade. We must ensure that these tools evolve along with them. To that end, I look forward to hearing perspectives from the witnesses on a range of bipartisan legislative proposals and ideas. For example, Senators Casey and Cornyn are working on legislation to address a gap in our existing national security authorities risk posed by certain outbound U.S. investments. Senators Tester and Rounds on this committee have legislation to address concerns related to Chinese ownership of U.S. farmland and agriculture businesses. Senators Wyden and Loomis, Senators Wyden and Lummis on this committee have a proposal that would impose export controls and personal data. Senator Warner on this committee and Senator Thune have legislation to address concerns related to information and communications technology trans transactions. This committee will examine a range of other proposals to address challenges posed by China related to Taiwan, technology development, digital assets, export controls, other issues. We all agree China is a real and growing threat. Our committee must play a leadership role in countering that threat. Today's hearing is another important step as we work, work together to safeguard our national security. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to, to, to the witnesses for being here with us today. Every day there's a new story after new story about foreign adversaries searching for a foothold to expand their global reach. Whether it's China brokering so-called peace deals to Russia, continued invasion of Ukraine, or Chinese precursors sent to Mexico 
to fuel cartels' deadly fentanyl trade, America needs to have strong leadership. Today, we'll hear from Biden administration witnesses from Treasury and Commerce to better understand their thinking and, frankly, learn why the White House is choosing to follow instead of leading. Advancing U.S. national security, economic security, and foreign policy are all vital to our domestic security here at home. As I've said before, you can't secure your house with the doors wide open. In our ever-connected and ever-evolving world, the United States and our vibrant economy are continuously impacted by other countries. We spend a great deal of our time on this committee discussing our government's response to our own economic issues, but it is vital to consider the decisions being made oceans away by governments and countries with very different ideals and values than those we hold near and dear here at home in America. China is at the top of that list. For years, China has grown in force and strength, persistently engaging in coerced economic policies to further its interests and undermine those of the United States and our allies. To try and gain a leg up on America and our allies, China has resorted to intellectual property theft, unfair trade practices, and other harmful actions that ultimately challenge free markets and U.S. innovation. And innovation is the crown jewel of America's success. It's about the birth of ideas and the fertile ground for them to grow and to prosper. As the internet creates a web of connectivity worldwide, protecting American data from would-be bad actors like China becomes even more important. That's why I recently introduced a Know Your App Act to increase transparency and protect Americans by requiring app stores to label apps controlled by foreign adversaries. It's about empowering our parents with information to make informed decisions. Further, China exploited America's openness to do business on the global stage. But we cut our own selves off with rules and regulations dictating everything from climate requirements to burdensome building regulations taken to an extreme, making it more and more difficult to build here at home and perversely encouraging companies to search for more open environments around the globe. There should never be a world, there should never be a world where a company finds China easier to do business in a better business environment. Our country was built on freedom, hard work, and innovation. We should encourage policies that foster these ideals in the marketplace and that means lessening burdensome regulations. Furthermore, American companies should not be on an uneven playing field simply because they must abide by progressive regulations far stricter than the ones in China. We must work simultaneously to provide businesses with room for growth and opportunity here at home while also robustly responding to China's unfair practices globally. The United States possesses tools to curb China's economic aggression, including sanctions, export controls, and investment screening but we must use these tools strategically and effectively. Policymakers must think beyond the Washington bubble and ensure that when the government uses its economic security tools, it evaluates the economic impact on communities and small businesses across our country. From securing our farmland to protecting our U.S. technological innovators, this is the lifeblood of our economy and our communities. I know that firsthand from my home state of South Carolina, where advanced manufacturing is our engine, we have some of the largest global brands making their home in South Carolina. The foreign direct investment in my state is tremendous, from BMW to Volvo, an important component of the success that we offer the nation from South Carolina. After all, efforts to advance national security will never succeed if the government undermines the economic security and economic opportunities of everyday Americans. Regrettably, under Biden, President Biden, America's economic strength has waned, and the administration has led this country down a path of reckless spending that has led to a 40-year high in inflation, which every single American knows all too well. The more this administration spends on progressive policies, the more their attention is diverted from issues that our communities actually need the federal government to focus on, like preventing the deadly fentanyl deaths that Chairman Brown alluded to. The Chinese Communist Party is facilitating the flow of the deadly fentanyl into our nation's 
through the Mexican cartels, leading to 70,000 American deaths. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for young Americans. The leading cause of death. Americans who will never marry, have children, grow old, or make an investment into our economy simply because they took fentanyl. That's why I, along with Chairman Brown, introduced the Fend Off Fentanyl Act, which will target the illicit fentanyl supply chain using sanctions to choke off the income of cartels in the Chinese laboratories that make precursors of this deadly drug. We must hit them, of course, where it hurts the most, which means in their wallets. We must boost economic growth and competitiveness through a renewed commitment to free enterprise, free trade, rule of law, and an international U.S. leadership. And we must maintain our technological edge, promote capital formation, and ensure supply chain resilience. Let me close with this. Concerns about China's rising strength and aggression are certainly understandable. However, American and America can always outcompete China. Our economic system and our values have lifted countless people out of poverty by providing economic freedom for everyday people to work hard, apply their talents, and pursue their dreams. There's no better system in the world today. It's time we renew our commitment to the principles that made us the greatest nation on God's green earth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. I'll introduce today's witnesses. All four of you were uh, confirmed through this committee and onto the Senate floor. Uh, Elizabeth Rosenberg has been back at least once since then. She's Assistant Secretary for Terrorism, Financing, and finan Financial Crimes at Treasury. Paul Rosen is Assistant Secretary for Investment Security at Treasury. Welcome to, to the both of you. Uh, Taya Kendler is Assistant Secretary for Export Administration at Commerce. Welcome. Max Axelrod is Assistant Secretary for Export Export Enforcement at Treasury. I would welcome all of you back. Uh, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, you start. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Brown, <clears throat> Ranking Member Scott, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on countering China, advancing U.S. national security, economic security, and foreign policy. The United States and the PRC are the two largest economies in the world. Despite the current tensions in our relationship, cooperation between the two countries is absolutely critical in addressing important global challenges like the climate and managing international debt distress. As Secretary Yellen has recently noted, the United States does not seek conflict, but rather a constructive and fair economic relationship with China, one where we can work together when possible for the benefit of our countries and the world. Our economic approach to China is guided by three objectives. <clears throat> Securing the national security interests of the United States and our allies and partners, and promoting respect for human rights. Seeking an economic relationship with China that fosters growth and innovation in both countries through healthy competition, and cooperating on the urgent global challenges of the day. As I have responsibility for coordinating Treasury policies to address, expose, and target national security threats, I'll briefly address security challenges related to the PRC and the tools at Treasury's disposal to address them. I've provided more details on these challenges in my written statement. The first of our national security concerns related to the PRC is its challenge to global norms, norms that have maintained peace and had a part in enabling the PRC's economic growth. This includes acts of economic coercion, economic espionage, transnational crime, and human rights abuse. Furthermore, we are concerned with China's role in the illicit narcotics trade. That is why just yesterday, Treasury sanctioned and exposed a drug trafficking network that included Chinese individuals and entities responsible for shipping pill press machinery for counterfeit pill manufacturing, including those involved with fentanyl-laced pill production. Another concern is the PRC's role in geopolitical conflict around the world, including related to Russia, North Korea, and China's militarization of international spaces. PRC support for those countries I noted and increased tension along its borders, including in international waterways and airspace, further destabilizes precarious situations, increasing the risk for misunderstanding and miscalculation. On Russia, for example, we have sanctioned Chinese entities exporting items to Russia in support of its brutal, 
illegal invasion of Ukraine's sovereign territory, Chinese continued support for Russia will only prolong that conflict. I want to focus now on the suite of Treasury tools and how we deploy them in service of our national security concerns. First, Treasury publicly exposes threatening activity, including through financial sanctions. Public exposure and targeting individuals and entities through a sanctions designation gives financial institutions and other organizations a fuller picture of the illicit activity and greater ability to distance themselves from the threat. This is often the case for our drug trafficking sanctions where we map and expose the networks moving the narcotics and the funds. In addition, Treasury regularly engages the private sector, providing typologies and red flag indicators, as well as partner and ally nations who share similar concerns and can take complementary enforcement actions. Another way we protect our national security interests is by strengthening international anti-financial crime standards and by building partner consensus around them. Leadership in the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism, is a major way we accomplish this. By leveraging this international forum and building agreement around model laws and best practices, we increase the cost for actors to reject these norms. To conclude, the United States can effectively manage our relationship with China by clearly conveying our interests and intentions, including about our specific national security concerns. Indeed, the health of the global economy rests on how we, both the United States and China, can manage our relationship and address pressing shared challenges. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Assistant Secretary Rosen. Assistant Secretary Rosen. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, distinguished members of the committee. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today to testify on this important national security topic. At the Department of the Treasury, we understand the significant challenge that China poses to the economic and national security interests of the United States. I manage the government's review of foreign investment coming into the United States through the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. In this work, we are focused on stopping the access and exploitation of sensitive technologies, infrastructure, data, and other assets by those that have the intent and capability to harm our national security. Recently, Senators Secretary Yellen addressed the U.S.-China economic relationship. In her remarks, she conveyed that China and the United States can and need to find a way to live together and share in global prosperity. She also stressed the importance of our countries working together when possible for the benefit of the world. At the same time, Secretary Yellen was crystal clear when it comes to national security. The United States will secure our national security interests and those of our allies and partners. We will remain firm in our conviction to defend our values. We will not hesitate to defend our vital interests and we will not compromise on national security concerns even when they force trade-offs with economic interests. We will fully and zealously exercise our economic tools to protect the national security of the United States. CFIUS is one important tool to address national security that pursues these objectives. The committee, comprised of the heads of sec several executive branch agencies, which I help lead in support of the Secretary of the Treasury's role as chair, carefully reviews foreign investment in the United States for national security risks. When necessary, the, the committee takes action to address such risks while seeking to maintain an open investment environment and the status of the United States as one of the top destination for foreign direct investment in the world. Over the years, as the national security threat environment has evolved, so is CFIUS. First established, as you know, by executive order in 1975, the committee has benefited from congressional action to codify and enhance its authorities. As was pointed out by the chairman, most recently Congress did, did so with a bipartisan Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act of 2018. Among other things, FIRMA provided the, the, the committee with important authorities over certain investment structures that had previously fallen outside of its jurisdiction and modernized our processes and procedures to better and more timely and more effectively review covered transactions. It also importantly provided the committee which, with much needed jurisdiction over certain transactions involving real estate in close proximity to sensitive facilities. 
Since I was confirmed in the role as Assistant Secretary for Investment Security, I've been focused on making sure CFIUS operates efficiently and effectively, bringing to bear all of our available resources and tools to support our important national security mission. This effort includes the issuance of the first executive order since the committee was established to provide formal presidential direction on additional risks that we are to consider when reviewing a covered transaction. It also includes the issuance of our first ever enforcement and penalty guidelines to ensure that transaction parties are held accountable for failing to comply with our laws and for not upholding their obligations to mitigate national security risk. While Congress rightly put in place strict confidentiality requirements for information filed with CFIUS, we have and will continue to take enforcement actions in particular matters to protect our national security. We're also enhancing our tactics and techniques to ensure that we're gathering more detailed information about foreign acquirers, more detailed information about deal structures, and thoroughly, the national, thoroughly assess the national security risks arising in connection with any transaction. We also continue to enhance our ability to identify non-notified transactions, that is, transactions that aren't voluntarily brought to CFIUS, and we're also engaging with our international partners and allies. Finally, as we protect national security in the, in the context of inbound investment, we continue to contribute to the interagency discussions regarding policies to restrict certain U.S. outbound investment flows in specific sensitive technologies with significant national security implications. Our desire is to avoid situations in which U.S. investments and business know-how support the advance of technologies that enhance the military or intelligence capabilities in countries of concern that could undermine our national security and put Americans at risk. While we're proud of the committee's work, our work remains unfinished and there's always more we can do. We remain focused on being effective as we can in our national security mission and you have my commitment, Senators, that we will use all of our available authorities to protect the national security of the United States, including in particular against national security threats posed by the PRC. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Assistant, Assistant Secretary Kenler. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today about the Commerce Department Bureau of Industry and Security's ongoing efforts to counter China's military modernization and human rights abuses. In the past year, BIS and our dual-use export control tools have stepped into the spotlight. In February 2022, we cut off Russian access to technology it needs to wage its brutal war against Ukraine. We barred the export of thousands of weapons components and other items needed by Russia's military, including classic dual-use items like radio frequency converters. Working with 38 allies and partners, we're also barring certain exports to countries helping Russia, including Iran and its drone programs. With the advanced computing rule we released in October of last year, BIS has hammered China's ability to use artificial intelligence and supercomputing power to develop its military. We are restricting exports of leading edge semiconductors and also of semiconductor manufacturing equipment and related activities by US persons. Even foreign made chips produced with certain US technology or tooling are restricted. China has tried to characterize our actions as meant to restrain its economic growth. Let me be clear. Advanced semiconductors are key to developing advanced weapons. They also support surveillance systems for human rights abuses. We focus solely on national security and human rights considerations when imposing these measures. It bears noting that when we impose controls involving products made overseas, we work closely with other manufacturing countries. BIS embraces the significant responsibility of working with international partners to explain the rationale for our export control policies and where possible, including them in our efforts. In addition to technology specific controls, BIS has restricted exports to organizations acting against US national security and foreign policy interests by adding them to our entity list. Of the nearly 700 PRC parties on the BIS entity list, over 200 have been added during this administration. Since implementing these restrictions, we have seen the increasing impact of our controls, including through desperate efforts by Russia and China to obtain the items we have cut off. This shows that our controls are working. 
And even as we hone current controls in our ever-evolving technology, technological landscape, BIS is focused on our next moves, reviewing the cutting-edge technology areas of autonomous systems, quantum information sciences, biotechnology, and advanced materials and manufacturing. Export controls are not being used to pursue economic decoupling with China. Our approach to China is calibrated and targeted. China's military civil fusion strategy under the Chinese Communist Party's government system necessitates stronger export controls targeting advanced commercial items that can be used in military applications. We seek to counter China's military modernization by restricting key sensitive technologies without undercutting US technological leadership or unduly interfering with commercial trade that doesn't undermine national security. This is all part of the review of our approach to China that Undersecretary Alan Estevez has identified to this committee. Moreover, BIS never acts alone. I'm deeply grateful for our partnership with the Defense, Energy, and State Departments, as well as the intelligence community and law enforcement agencies. Following collectively agreed upon policies and considering all sources of information, open source, business proprietary, and classified, we work together to closely scrutinize license applications involving transactions with China. Last calendar year, license applications involving China were about 13% of all the license applications we received, 5,064. We denied or returned without action about 26% of China applications. And on average, we spent a lot more time scrutinizing these applications. 90 days last year, a little over double the 43 days we took to process non-China applications. We prioritize comprehensive review, and we are taking the time to ensure that China license applications are carefully reviewed. BIS is laser focused on aggressively and appropriately contending with the strategic technology threat proposed, posed by China. We will continue to use all our tools to counter China's efforts to outpace the United States and our allies to the benefit of its military. Thank you, and I welcome your questions this morning. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Axelrod. You're up, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, distinguished members of the committee. Um, thank you for inviting me to testify today on our ongoing efforts to deny the People's Republic of China access to restricted U.S. technologies. As the Assistant Secretary for Export Enforcement at the Department of Commerce, I oversee a team of law enforcement agents and analysts who carry out a critical national security mission, keeping our country's most sensitive technologies out of the world's most dangerous hands. At no point in history has this mission been more important, especially when it comes to the PRC. As our intelligence community's most recent annual threat assessment notes, quote, China has the capability to directly attempt to alter the rules-based global order in every realm and across multiple regions as a near-peer competitor that is increasingly pushing to change global norms and potentially threatening its neighbors, end quote. Here's what my team has been doing to meet this unprecedented moment. First, we've enhanced our enforcement policies. Second, we've expanded our partnerships at home and abroad. And third, we've taken aggressive enforcement actions to impose real costs on those who seek to violate our rules and undermine US national security, both in China and elsewhere. On enforcement policies, we've updated them to ensure that our finite resources are best positioned to have maximum national security impact. Last June, for example, we announced that we are raising penalties for more serious violations, prioritizing the most serious cases, and eliminating no admit, no deny settlements. We also made our administrative charging letters public when filed, so now, as soon as we allege someone has violated our rules, everybody knows it. In October, we issued a policy announcing that when a foreign government fails to schedule our end use checks in a timely way, we generally seek to move the unchecked parties onto our unverified list, and then from the unverified list to the entity list. Prior to this policy, the Chinese government had not scheduled a single end use check for us in over two years. In the seven months since the policy issued, we've completed over 90. Next, partnerships. 
given the scope of the threat we face in protecting U.S. technology from misappropriation by the PRC government and others, we know we must amplify our efforts through robust partnerships. It's why we join with the Department of Justice, the FBI, and Homeland Security Investigations to form the Disruptive Technology Strike Force, which works to protect advanced U.S. technologies from being illicitly acquired by nation-state actors such as China, Russia, and Iran. We also have developed close partnerships with industry, academia through our academic outreach initiative, the intelligence community, and treasury components like OFAC and FinCEN. In the past year, we've put out multiple joint alerts and advisories with these partners designed to educate industry and academia on how best to comply with our rules and detect violations of them. We also partner closely with our international counterparts, bilaterally, multilaterally, and through our end use check program. We're working with the G7, the EU, and our Five Eyes allies to create an enforcement coordination mechanism that will help us work more closely together to combat export control evasion. And finally, our enforcement actions. Just two weeks ago, alongside DOJ, FBI, and HSI, we announced the first wave of strike force actions, including charges in five different cases across the country, three of which touch the PRC. In two California cases, the defendants are charged with stealing sensitive American technology and shipping it to restricted Chinese entities. In a third case from Manhattan, the defendant is alleged to have used a sanctioned Chinese entity as a front company to aid Iranian ballistic missile procurement. And last month, we announced a $300 million penalty against Seagate technology for selling millions of hard disk drives to Huawei, even after Seagate's only two competitors had stopped selling due to our foreign direct product rule. It's the largest standalone administrative penalty in our history. And it sends a clear message about the need for companies to comply with our rules and about the power of our administrative enforcement tools when they don't. In conclusion, as Beijing seeks to spread its technology-driven authoritarianism the world over, our export enforcement team remains hyper-focused on preventing the PRC from illegally obtaining sensitive U.S. items. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today about our work, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Rosen, can you describe the gap in existing authorities and the national security risks that an outbound investment mechanism would address? Thank you, Chairman Brown, for that question. I appreciate uh, the Senate's uh, and, and Senator Cornyn and Casey's leadership and other members on this important topic. Um, what the administration is, is looking to do here and actively assessing is establishing a program that gets at U.S. investment money and the know-how and expertise that goes with that money into sectors of concern in countries of concern in a narrow and targeted way that gets at the investments that would develop the technologies that would be used from a military or intelligence way against the United States. We currently assess that looking at our existing tools, including those at the table, including export controls, which go after items, for example, and, critical, and covered in critical technologies, or my colleague here talking about sanctions and targeting individuals or entities, and of course, CFIUS, which monitors inbound investment, we currently assess we don't have an effective tool to target the money and sophistication with know-how that goes into these sensitive and most critical technologies into countries of concern. What happens if we don't address this? I think we risk um, leaving a gap in terms of some of our national security concerns and uh, addressing some of the issues that I laid out, Senator. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Rosenberg, um, Last month, Ranking Member Scott and I introduced, as he said and as I said in our opening statements, the Fentanyl Act oversight hearing in the House. Brian Nelson, the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, spoke about his trip to the Mexican border and Treasury efforts at addressing the fentanyl crisis by targeting Chinese suppliers, Mexican cartels, and money launderers profiting from the illicit, illicit drug sale, uh, drug trade. Uh, Secretary, Rosen, Secretary Rosenberg, yes or no, do you agree with the Undersecretary about the nature of the threat and the targets to address uh, the fentanyl crisis? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. I certainly agree about the nature of the threat and those particular targets. This is a challenging uh, issue on which we have the opportunity to work uh, using our existing authorities. and. Uh, regarding the legislation that you had noted previously, uh, co-sponsored by yourself and a number of others, 
it's another opportunity for us to work closely with you for uh, under additional authorities to get after this problem. I, I assume that means you'll commit to helping us work to make this become law. Certainly, Senator. I'd be very happy to work with you and your colleagues on bringing this to fruition and to using its authorities. Uh, Secretary Kenler and Axelrod, uh, last year a significant increase in funding uh, through Ukraine's supplemental bills enabled BIS to take aggressive action to respond to Russia's war against Ukraine and to expand our engagement with U.S. allies on export controls. As important as export controls are to countering Russia's aggression, they're increasingly viewed as a critical element in China-U.S. policy, specifically ensuring that American innovation does not wind up in the wrong hands. Would you, starting with you, Secretary Kendler, describe how BIS used the funding it received through supplemental appropriations and what additional investments are necessary for BIS to address risks posed by China? Thank you, Senator. Uh, we used the Ukraine supplemental funding, uh, which, was, which was very valuable to us, uh, to ramp up license review involving Russia to review technologies that Russia was trying to obtain that it needed for its military uh, machine, uh, to step up data analysis of trends in procurement and transshipment, and for international cooperation and education on the Russia threat and, and Russia's procurement practices uh, and, and how we could address those through the uh, 38 plus members now of the Global Export Control Coalition uh, designed to, to restrict Russia's military capability. I, I do support the President's fiscal year 24 budget proposal. We can always do more with more and, and the Ukrainian uh, supplemental funding model would certainly be an example for how we could do more uh, with respect to the China military modernization and human rights threat. Secretary Axelrod, same question. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Senator. We used the Ukraine supplemental money in an impactful way. We were able to bring on 16 special agents and six intelligence analysts. And um, in addition, we were able to hire two export control officers, one for Finland and one for Taiwan. Um, by adding agents and analysts, it means that we're able to do more investigations which down the road will lead to more penalties. We can do more compliance checks. We can do more outreach to industry. Um, we can do more nomination packages for the entity list. It's a, been a very effective resource for us, Senator. Uh, Secretary, thank you. Secretary Rosenberg, really quickly, my time's run out. Discuss the challenges to building multilateral conditions and how Congress can support your multilateral efforts uh, on export controls and sanctions. The multilateralism of the uh, use of our tools is essential for their utility. We've learned that uh, over the past uh, year and a quarter um, that we have been seeking to respond to Russia's brutal war. We engage directly at a high level uh, in order to build those coalitions. Uh, as Assistant Secretary Kendler mentioned, there's uh, uh, formal uh, bodies, groupings of bodies to develop and uh, find commonality in the approaches that we take. We use our attache program we offer and receive technical guidance to align our various authorities. And of course, we issue designations wherever possible, sanctions designations, in coordination with our foreign partners. Thank you, Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Rosenberg, I I've noted with some interest the executive branch has surged its economic statecraft tools to hold Russia accountable for its unjust war in Ukraine. Uh, the last few months, We've sanctioned hundreds, if not thousands, of Russian entities responsible for perpetuating the war in Ukraine. Not only were we able to identify these obscure targets, but we were also able to coordinate these actions, as you just talked about, a multilateral approach with our inter international partners uh, in Europe. Uh, this, to me, seems like a testament to U.S. government and, and the dominance that we can provide to the marketplace when we focus our attention on said target. The NIH reported that in 2021, we saw more than 70,000 Americans lose their lives to fentanyl. So my question is, as we think about the weight, I did an interview this morning and talked about the individual loss of life. But we think so often about the 70,000 people who've lost their lives to fentanyl. And sometimes the number itself is so overwhelming that we forget to personalize it. And I think about my friend in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Dr. Alan Shaw, whose son, Alan Shaw II, 27 years old, lost his life to fentanyl just two months ago. And I think about the tools that we may have at our disposal that could disrupt some of the cartels, and I think about, and perhaps it's easier to go to the front line, the top of the food chain, the, but, but the middle level folks, 
seem to need to be targeted as well. What, what from your vantage point, uh, overseeing TFFC, what, what is possible for us to, to, to do and to use more of the tools to disrupt the financials of not only the top of these cartels, but the mid-level as well? Is, is there more that we can do uh, in that area? And if so, how do we get there? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I very much appreciate the approach that you've just noted, not just of identifying the individuals who are the leaders of particular cartels or networks to move drugs and to move money, but also all of the individuals who work as uh, the front line, if you yes, will, for um, bundling money, for packaging materials and equipment, and of course the illicit drugs themselves. We've found that it's essential to be able to identify and expose and of course designate with sanctions, the front companies, the money, the exchange houses or money services businesses, the um, uh, other kinds of businesses that function as fronts in order to launder this money and move the goods and services. Furthermore, being able to explain through the use of typologies or those red flag indicators to other financial institutions or businesses that might come in contact with them the challenges and the risks involved so that they can avoid them is essential to this work of exposing and disrupting. So just to put a fine point on it, I heard what you said. I didn't fully hear your answer to my question. However, what else can we do from your perspective to, to use the tools that we have at our disposal to disrupt the, the flow of cash to these cartels? Is there more that we can do from your perspective, uh, certainly, uh, I think we have started targeting some of the heads and certainly think about the fact that we have 45 co-sponsors of my legislation on Fendoff Fentanyl. To get a Democrats and Republicans, 22, 22 on each side to do something together is like Peter walking on the water these days, right? It's almost a miracle. So the question is, is more legislation like that helpful, harmful? Do you need more tools? What say you? Uh, I appreciate the question. In addition to what I noted, there's something else I want to mention here as far as what we can do, uh, uh, what we can do additionally. Yes. And that is uh, two things. One is to work, uh, expand our relationships with foreign partners, specifically Mexico, which is something that was featured in the sanctions designation yesterday. It called out our partnership with Mexican law enforcement officials, which is a way that we can do an even better and more thorough job of getting at money movements and drug movements that traverse several different countries, which is so often the case when we have Chinese precursor chemicals moving through Mexico into the United States. One thing that's very significant and that I warmly welcome from the legislation uh, for which you are a co-sponsor is the ex expansion of the statute of limitations on enforcement against AIPA crimes to eight years from five. Respectfully, I would request that this be expanded even further to 10 years, which would allow us additional significant benefit in compliance and deterrence. Great, the legislation that I'm sponsoring, that, that, that's good to hear. And I'll, if I get another round, I know I'm out of time. So. Yeah, if I can get to a quick question for you, Secretary Rosen. Uh, one of the things uh, I've spent some time on is trying to figure out how to uh, disconnect uh, TikTok from having surveillance opportunities of our kids. And one of the ways that we try to do that is in legislation that we've worked on called Know Your App Act, which is a forward-looking solution to ensure Americans are empowered to decide for themselves how to best protect their data and their security. From your viewpoint as Assistant Secretary for Investment Security, do you think providing users with the country of origin uh, on their application of their application is a useful consumer protection measure? Thank you for that question, um, Senator, and I certainly share the concern emanating um, in the legislation. More information on these topics for parents uh, and also just general transparency is very important, particularly when you're talking about countries of concern and particularly when you're talking about countries of concern with laws on the books uh, that see no line between being able to access and manipulate that data. So I'm certainly, um, uh, certainly willing to work with you on that and understand those issues. And, and my last point, not for not a question, but I'll have a question for the record on, on CFIUS and how we can look back and, and track the progress that's been made over the last couple of years and or the impediments to progress from your perspective as it relates to using that very important tool 
to perhaps uh, put a target on the backs of folks that we uh, think we need to. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Reed of Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel for excellent testimony. Uh, private markets are notoriously opaque, uh, unlike other financial institutions. Private equity funds and hedge funds are exempt from requirements to maintain money laundering programs, anti-money laundering programs verify the identities of their customers, and report business transactions to the government, which I think is a huge oversight. But Secretary Rosenberg, Secretary Rosen, has Treasury observed individuals and companies with ties to the Chinese Commerce Party investing in U.S. managed hedge funds and private equity funds? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I'd be happy to begin. Uh, this is a concern for us. It's a national security concern. When we're thinking about, if you will, vulnerabilities in our AML system that may result from uh, uh, inadequate uh, regulatory treatment uh, for certain areas. What you've just noted here with respect to uh, regulatory treatment for areas of uh, investment advisors, for example, private money, that's an area we've been looking at quite carefully. We've seen uh, Russian oligarchs, unfortunately, exploiting this, as well as other fund managers launder millions of dollars through our system in this way. I'm also quite concerned about it when it comes to Chinese uh, money moving into the United States, including that may influence our investment security that my colleague has responsibility for. We'd be very happy to work with you, appreciating the leadership of Congress on this issue, where I know that there's significant concern. Secretary Rosen. Thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. From a, from a CFIUS perspective, it's a, it's a critical issue and goes to sort of issues of ultimate beneficial ownership and participation in these funds. And one of the things that we are redoubling our efforts on is to look behind the investors, really digging in, not just looking at general partners, but who are the limited partners? Um, what is the information about the limited partners? How much information do they get? And so when it comes to these kinds of investment funds, really doing the diligence to not just look at the deal structure, but who's behind it and not being satisfied with just a shell company, understanding who is actually doing the investment. But they have no legal obligation to tell you. Um, they, they can't get through CFIUS unless they don't tell us. And so, um, so while we don't have the regulatory framework that requires these specificities, if they want to get through the CFIUS review process, um, they're generally yeah. highly motivated to give us that information. Let me put this in perspective. Uh, from 2021, uh, 20, 2020 rather, 2021 and 22, over $2 trillion of Chinese investments were placed in private funds. That's a lot of money, and it's going to a lot of places. Secretary uh, Rosenberg, are you aware of any investment in national the defense companies, uh, our, our, our major uh, clients of the Department of Defense? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I, I would defer the specific answer to that to uh, my colleagues from CFIUS, as well as, of course, the Department of Defense. But I would note from my perspective, uh, thinking about the regulatory treatment broadly for investments foreign and domestic in this sector or management of investment funds, that's an area of vulnerability for the United States where we must approach it at se from several different perspectives, not just the regulatory treatment, but of course also any national security implications resulting from foreign funds flowing in as well. Well, I think there are profound national security implications. I do national security work on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, uh, let me ask you a question. In 2015, the Treasury proposed a rule to impose AML requirements on private equity funds and hedge funds. And I've called for the Department to finalize the rule, including a letter I sent in March of 2022, more than a year ago. So why haven't you finalized this rule since this poses a, I think, a potential and maybe actual serious threat to national security of the United States? Thank you, Senator. I want to agree with and affirm your national security concern that you've identified just now and in that letter to begin with. Uh, this is an area that I'm quite concerned about and that I uh, have asked my team to look at broadly, gathering further uh, up-to-date information, which we have done in the form of the uh, money laundering threat assessment for the United States and where we are seeking to direct resources now in order to find appropriate regulatory treatment at this time. Be bearing in mind that 2015, uh, uh, much has changed in this sector as well since that time. Well, n knowing where they're getting their money from, knowing where it's going, has a profound effect given the $2 trillion in three years that's flowing in from China on our national security. I'm concerned from a national security standpoint. Um, 
you know, we're, we're no old saying, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. In fact, both feet. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Reed. Senator Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Roseman Kindler. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, we're talking about restricting the American private sector from making investments in foreign countries in the interest of national security. Are we not? Senator, I, th I think you're asking about outbound uh, investment yes. restrictions. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, that is the okay. nature. Of and the sometimes that may be necessary. Am I correct? I, I think that's correct, yes. Okay. Um, my question is, is the Biden administration doing the same thing for the foreign aid that it gives to foreign countries? For example, we're still, the Biden administration is giving over a billion dollars in foreign aid to South Africa, is it not? Senator, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to defer that to a different department. It, well, it are, are, we, are we reviewing that as to whether it's in the interest of national security? I, I'm sorry, Senator. That uh, We look at technology transfers, and we are, we are reviewing those carefully to determine. Yeah, but if we give them the money, they could use it to buy technology, correct? If it is restricted under our regulations, uh, I, I would say no, sir. Mm -hmm. Respectfully, we uh, our export controls are in place to restrict technology transfers, whether it's goods, software, or technical that. data. But, but but we're still giving a lot of the Biden administration is still giving a lot of foreign aid. And what I'm asking is, is it reviewing that foreign aid w with the same national security standards that you're proposing to restrict the private sector? I'm sorry, Senator, I'm simply not in a position to answer that, but I'd be happy to take it back and continue yeah, if you, working with you we're, on that. We're, we, the Biden administration is still giving money to the Wuhan lab, is it not? I, I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, I, I focus on technology transfers. I'm not familiar with Do you with know you. if we're reviewing that money in the interest of national security? I, I do not. I'm sorry. Okay, could you get me an answer for that one? Yes, we will find the right people to get to you. Okay. Um, Secretary Rosenberg, in your opening comments, you said it's important that we maintain a relationship with China so we can work together on, um, on I believe you said, climate change and debt relief. I thought you might have also said to contain the... the uh, um, the threat of nuclear warfare, but that's just me. Um, I want to ask you about the debt relief. Um, many foreign countries owe debt that they can't pay back. Do they not? Uh, yes, Senator, that's true. And if I may, with respect to nuclear proliferation and its Yes, ma'am, but I don't want to get off on nuclear proliferation because I'm going to run out of time. Um, and some of those countries that owe money that they can't pay back owe that money to the American people, either individually or as businesses. Is that correct? That, uh, uh, I don't have particular responsibility over uh, foreign debt matters, although I do... Well, you mentioned it. Am I correct? I did mention it, and I do believe you are correct, while I don't have okay. specifics at my, at my disposal. I understand. And the Biden administration is leaning on these Americans to whom these foreign countries owe money to forgive that money. Is it not? Senator, I would be happy to follow up with you further on that, if I may, with respect yeah, to yeah, Chinese it, debt dependency. If you could just answer my question first. The Biden administration is leaning on American individuals and businesses to forgive debt to foreign countries. Is it not? I would have to follow up with you with further information, which is I do it not, not. I unfortunately do not have an answer to that question. At oh, this time. you know the answer. You mentioned it in your opening remarks. It is. Unfortunately, Senator, I don't have an answer. You know you. what the Paris Club is? Senator, this is not my area of responsibility. Do you know what the Paris Club is? 
Yes, Senator. Well, the Biden administration is leaning on American businesses and individuals to forgive debt that foreign countries owe them, but China's refusing. Is it not? Senator, I would be very happy to follow up with you. You don't want to talk about that? Unfortunately, this is not my area of specific expertise. Yes, ma'am, but you, you're a smart person, and you mentioned it. I have a feeling you know about it. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position to offer specific information at this time. You, you, you won't or you can't? I do not have at my disposal details of uh, that you're looking for right now, though I would be very happy to follow but up. But am I right colleagues. that the Biden administration is leaning on the American people to forgive debt that, that, that foreign countries owe them while allowing China to skate? Senator, I, I believe I understand your question and the significance of it. Nevertheless, I'm not in a position to answer it with specificity at this time. You won't or you can't? I am not able to answer with specifics on this question, but I would be more than happy to follow up with you with my colleagues. In private? Certainly, I, I, I'm sure Don't that can be. Don't you think the public need, needs to know this as well? I appreciate the point, and I wouldn't dispute that either. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to offer you Senator answers Kennedy, to those questions. Okay. Would Kennedy, you check Senator on the Kennedy, Wuhan Senator lab Kennedy. for me too? Senator I will Kennedy, you can, make, you can make her answer as public as you would like once she answers you or someone at Treasury answers you. Um, Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at a time of increasing challenges from adversaries seeking to threaten the international order, uh, from my perch as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I'm increasingly of the view that the United States uh, has to lead the creation of an economic alliance among like-minded countries that can provide a framework for cooperative action in response to military aggression, violations of sovereignty, economic coercion, and retaliation by adversaries. Uh, so while I welcome the G7 leader statement calling for the creation of a new coordination platform on economic coercion to promote cooperation within and beyond the G7, I think we have to go further. I'm currently drafting legislation that would direct the administration to create a common economic defense mechanism that would counter economic coercion, build supply chain resilience, promote stronger export controls, and protect critical technologies. So I would like to have each of your offices assistance in creating uh, this bill. So my first question is, will each of you commit to working with my office uh, on creating input and drafting this legislation? Yes, Senator, certainly. Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Thank you all very much. Look forward to working with you. Our lack of outbound investment oversight in sensitive industries has the potential to harm our national security and hamper the competitiveness of U.S. industry because of our technical prow uh, prowess capital and the unique know-how that access to the U.S. capital markets provides, the President's budget requested funding to support the establishment of such an outbound investment review mechanism by executive action. So Assistant Secretary Rosen, how will you scope a screening tool such that it is broad enough to prevent U.S. capital and expertise from financing investments in critical sectors that undermine U.S. national security, but narrow enough to actually be implementable. Senator, thank you for the question, um, and and I think you, you, she sort of hit the, the nail on the head, which is we are working to craft a narrow and focused program on national security, but that achieves these core objectives. And what we are <clears throat> thinking, uh, currently working towards, is a program that restricts the flow of uh, U.S. investment dollars that comes with know-how and expertise into certain and specific sectors and subsectors of concern, such as advanced semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing that can be used by countries of concern, in, in this case, uh, particularly the PRC, for the benefit of their military, intelligence capabilities, and mass surveillance. And so we are focused on being narrow and tailored. Mm -hmm. and we're also focused in a program uh, that is understandable mm -hmm. by the public and the business community and administrable. What steps are you taking uh, to bring other major capital markets on board so that our allies and partners are prepared to take similar steps? 
Uh, another excellent point, we've been engaged in a robust dialogue with our allies and partners. Um, you saw, you've seen some of the outputs of this from the G7 statement um, by the President of the European Commission as well. Um, and um, under uh, Secretary Yellen's leadership, we have been engaged in a robust dialogue, not just to sort of share what we are thinking, um, but also to um, help share what our national security concerns are so that other countries can assess whether something similar is in their best interest, because uh, we believe when you go multilaterally, it's always more effective. All right. I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing the work. Um, I commend the administration for the unprecedented range of sanctions it has imposed on Russian actors in response to the invasion of Ukraine. And while I believe we need to focus on enforcement, we need to address the fact that China continues to enable Putin's war machine. Uh, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, what steps are you taking to target enablers of Putin's inner circle and war-making capabilities? including such enablers in the People's Republic of China? Thank you, Senator, for the question. We are strongly committed to ensuring that Russia is not able to gain access to money and material to fund its war and to enforcing our sanctions, as you have noted. We've made clear to any individual or entities that might uh, go forward and evade those sanctions that we will not tolerate this, including specifically with respect to China, at the level of president to president. In order to make good on that commitment that there should be consequences for enablers of sanctions evasion, we have designated a number of Chinese entities and individuals that have uh, participated uh, in the evasion of sanctions. So with respect to Russia, starting just this year, in January, we designated a, uh, a firm uh, known as Spacity that is providing satellite imagery of the battlefield in Ukraine to the Wagner Group in fighting the war. We've also designated in uh, April and in this month as well a number of uh, entities that were involved in providing financial front services as well as participating in procurement networks. But not many networks. individuals. Entities, but not many individuals. I, we have designated many Chinese individuals in the past and wouldn't hesitate to do so if there was an opportunity. Could you forward to my office the public list of the individuals and entities that have been sanctioned in this regard? Certainly, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Uh, uh, Senator Hegarty is recognized from Tennessee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, at the recent G7 meeting in Japan, President Biden described the China, the China spy balloon incident in which a Chinese high altitude surveillance ship violated American sovereignty as, quote, silly. To be frank, I don't find the Chinese spy balloon incident to be silly, and neither do the American people. That's why in my capacity as ranking member of the banking subcommittee that oversees export controls, I sent a letter to Secretary Raimondo yesterday. In this letter, I requested export licensing data from Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security to see what American technologies were approved for export to China's aerospace sector, including to those in China who manufacture these types of spy balloons and their payloads. Mr. Chair, I'd like to submit this letter for the record. Without objection, sorry. Thank you. Assistant Secretaries Kendler and Axelrod, do you agree to fully comply with my request for export licensing data, which Section 1761 of the Export Control Reform Act of 2018, or ECRA, requires the Commerce Department, if asked, to share with my subcommittee. Senator, we will certainly comply with the terms of ECRA in responding to your letter. Mr. Axelrod? Same answer, Senator. Thank you. I'm very concerned about news reports that the Biden administration continues to conceal attempts for more transparency on China's spy balloon incident, including a taxpayer-funded FBI report on this incident. That's why I'm using my authority under ECRA to ensure transparency on the extent to which U.S. technology exports have contributed to threats like China's spy balloon program. On April 26, Secretary Raimondo told Congress that her department has put over 200 companies on the entity list for export controls during her tenure. This statistic appears like an accomplishment at face value, but it falls drastically short of the, pre short of the previous administration standard. Frankly, in 2020, the Commerce Department added 147 companies to the entity list. And in 2021, that number decreased to 85. And in 2022, that number further decreased down to 68 Chinese companies that have been added to the entity list. Assistant Secretary Kindler, what's the explanation for this drastic decrease in the Commerce Department's entities listings? 
Senator, I'd like to make sure that you have the right information. I believe it's 205 entities that have been added uh, under the Biden administration in China. Are you disputing the level that I'm talking about? These numbers add up to that number over the course of two and a half years. Just in the last year of the previous administration, 147 companies were added to the entity list. And what we have seen is a decrease year over year to get to the total that you just named. But Why are we decreasing? Why are you decreasing the activity in light of the fact that we've seen more and more of Chinese, the CCP, I should say, predatory behavior? Senator, I just want to make sure that we're being clear that these are Chinese entities, not overall entities. Um, it is correct that 205 entities in China have been added to the entity list. Why has there been a decrease year over year? That's my question. Can I get back to you on that? I want to make sure that we're operating with the same data, please. The data shows that there has been a decrease. And I want to understand the trend and what's underlying the trend. We are deeply focused as one of the two pillars of export controls on entities that pose national security and foreign policy threats to the United States, particularly in China. I am We've very concerned about this decrease. I'm also concerned about the fact that the Commerce Department still permits exports of U.S. technology to China's most worrisome state-owned defense enterprises, including, and I want to be specific here, Aviation Industry Corporation of China, China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, and China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. Let's turn to another issue that very much concerns me. That's Huawei. When I served as U.S. Ambassador to Japan, I worked very closely with the kitchen cabinet of Japanese government leaders, Japanese business leaders, to understand the threat of Huawei and what they could do in the 5G arena. I took my analysis back to Washington. I met with the president. We put a lot of pressure on the situation and persuaded this government to take action against Huawei and 5G. I did the same with the government of Japan to get Huawei out of 5G. I want to talk with you now about this issue, which clearly is of, of deep importance to me. I was very upset and disturbed to see an article in Reuters on May 11th that cited internal emails indicating that State Department delayed significant US measures against China after the spy balloon incident, including far-reaching export controls on Huawei. This is in May of this year. So Assistant Secretaries Kendler, Rosen, have the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security prepared a draft rule to revoke export control licenses related to Huawei? Senator, we do not have a draft rule in place at this time. However, we are looking very you closely at this Tell me, have you received rule? any guidance from within the Commerce Department or from anywhere in the interagency to, to back off and not do this? Senator, we are working closely uh, and we are under deep analysis of this issue. Huawei. I am I very concerned to see this administration basically back off and kowtow just so they can obtain high level meetings with, with you know, officials in China. This makes no sense. We should be speaking from a position of strength, not weakness. And this backing off is absolutely unacceptable. Senator, we have not backed Mr. off Mr. Chairman, this issue. I am Thank you, Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member for having this hearing. And I want to thank all of you for testifying today. I appreciate your testimony. I will start uh, w with you, Mr. Rosen, and, and thank you for what you're saying. Thank you for what you do. Would you classify food security and national security of, as being equivalent? Food issues. security and national security. Yes, Senator, and issues of food security, particularly when it comes to supply chain, yeah. are core national security issues. Uh, thanks for that. In my real life, I'm a farmer. Um, and interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, I started getting phone calls from folks about folks who are buying up land in north central Montana. And then I did some farm bill listening sessions earlier this year. And it was an issue that came up in every one of the uh, forums that I had. Uh, that resulted in uh, myself teaming up with a number of members of this committee, Senator Rounds, um, uh, to, um, to deal with American farmland, or should I say potential American farmland that would be bought up by China, Russia, Iran, uh, or North Korea. Um, so the first question I have for you is, um, right now, a covered transaction does not include farmland unless it's next to a designated military base. Is that correct? So th there's two prongs to this analysis, Senator. You are correct that one of the prongs from a purely real estate purchase yep. perspective yep. is proximity, as Congress articulated. Just the other, the other note is we have control jurisdiction, too, if the purchase involves the acquisition of a U.S. business. Okay. So, but I, what I want to focus on, we'll get to agribusiness in a second, but I just want to talk about the farmland 
situation for a second. So right now, if, if a piece of farmland is bought by a out of country um, individual or corporation, what are the triggers that would make you look and see if that was who bought that land? Are there any triggers? So if it, if it fell within our jurisdiction uh, under one of those prongs, we, yep. would, we would look okay. very closely at so it. So if we were to pass this legislation, I think there's 30 bills out there to do this. Or this is just one of many. Um, to regulate who's, who's, who's buying land and potentially even prevent uh, a company or an individual uh, from those four countries, and I'm not talking about a U.S. citizen, as far, I'm talking about people from those four countries, do you have the capacity to be able to enforce it? Well, I, I think your legislation that you have with Senator Rounds and Senator Kramer and others raises this very important issue. And you know, I, I want to work with you to figure out how we can address it from a resource perspective. Yep. You raise you raise an excellent question. Depending on what the scope of what you're considering, we would have to assess what that would bring in and whether that's targeting the national security. Yep. So. I have no idea how much land is being bought in this country by folks from outside this country, okay? Uh, we're just talking about four, four countries in this particular case with really a focus on China, let's be honest. Uh, but the others are important too. Um, but this bill doesn't work unless CFIUS can do the enforcement. You have to have an enforcement tool. You can't just say we're not gonna do this and you're the enforcement tool. So the real question I have is I don't want to write something that sounds good. You can put good press releases out on it, but it really doesn't do anything because we don't have the enforcement agency to do it. And since you're the enforcement agency, do you have capacity to do it? And how much more capacity, what would you need to be able to have capacity to be able to enforce a bill that would stop China or all four of the countries, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, from buying farmland in this country? Senator, I appreciate the question, particularly as it relates to administratability and, and resources. And what I would say is it would depend on the scope. If we brought in every single investment, that would be a different consideration than targeting the investments that, um, that you have a particular national security concern with. But what I can commit to you is I'm willing to go at this issue okay. with you and figure it out and um, work toward a solution. So we had uh, Senator Reid ask some questions on, 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 on investment funds. And, and we talked about how important it was for laundering money. We talked about how important it was for, from his perspective and mine too, by the way, of potentially investing in military production firms. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you that I don't know how much land is being bought right now in this country. Uh, and we haven't even got into agribusiness, by the way, which is just as big a concern. But we've gotta figure this out before it gets to be a crisis. And, and uh, I would hope that uh, Treasury, um, Ms. Rosenberg, Mr. Rosen, we can work with you because I, I just think this is a huge problem. Whether it's for laundering money or whether it's for national security or whether it's food security, it's all the same thing. And if we could get your help, we might be able to get a piece of legislation that actually functionally works. You have my commitment to work with you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Chester. Senator Vance of Ohio is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate you for hosting this committee. Um, and I, I want to focus a little bit on perhaps the unintended consequences of some of our Russia and Ukraine policy of the last year. And I direct my question to, to you, Ms. Rosenberg, and thank you all for being here. Um, so I've known this committee before. Our sanctions policy in Russia has been a complete and total failure. We thought that we would shrink the Russian economy by 10, 20, 30, even 50 percent, yet we've shrunk the Russian economy by very little uh, and if you compare it to the performance of other regional economies, and let's say in terms of the performance of its currency, it's actually doing pretty well relative to other world currencies. So the foreign policy establishment claimed that one of the strongest sanctions measures was the disconnection of Russian banks from SWIFT. Scholars claimed that this would kneecap the Russian economy, but while the Washington foreign policy establishment was preoccupied with crafting a sanctions regime, they failed to consider that Russia had been developing their own alternative to, to SWIFT, which is, of course, the SPFS. Ms. Rosenberg, I want to ask first, has the SPFS grown in response to being cut off from SWIFT, and by how much has it grown? Thank you, Senator, for the question. 
Um, we are uh, aware of and looking at the Russian payments uh, rail system, if you will, the yep. SPFS, um, which grew significantly earlier on and the earlier the prior stage of Russia sanctions in 2014 when it sought uh, when it saw some of the writing on the wall about its inability to access certain international financial uh, institutions or partners and began developing at that time. Yeah, so so my understanding, at least the Russian claims, are that they've integrated about 50 foreign banks just in the last couple of years onto the SPFS system. And to your point, it sounds like they integrated a lot more before, uh, from maybe 2014 to 2020, uh, perhaps 2021. The other really concerning thing, of course, is that India and Iran seem to be getting closer and closer to the Russian financial system even as they're getting further and further away from the American financial system, and in particular India, which we should all recognize as the most important geopolitical counterweight to China in the region, it's a very bad thing for them to be getting closer to Russia and China and the Russian financial system. J just for, for my edification and anybody else who's listening, could you speak a little bit to the national security importance? So what do, what do, what do we get out of uh, co cooperative organizations like SWIFT as the dominant global bank power, and what kind of access does our law enforcement have that they wouldn't have if you had major foreign powers shifting off of SWIFT? Thank you for the question. I have also noted with great concern some of the developments and expanding uh, efforts by Russia with several specific partners to have uh, direct and bilateral financial flows. You mentioned uh, India and Iran. Those are not the only ones. There are sure. other countries where this is a great concern. And as you pointed out, this is designed to be an effort to relieve and mitigate its dependency on international financial systems. So the reason why Russia, as we see it, is seeking to do this is because it has less and less connectivity with international financial architecture. It's not just SWIFT, it's also the correspondent banking relationships that have been cut off so significantly by the European and US and British sanctions that have severed, designated number of banks and severed those relationships. But I, the concern that I hear you expressing is concern we also have. We cannot rest knowing that we have designated over 80% of Russia's financial system and restricted their access to SWIFT systems. That is insufficient if they are still able to move around them and gain access to international financial channels. Yeah, I, I appreciate that and certainly agree with the emphasis there. My, my concern, I guess, is that our Ukraine policy has had this massive unintended consequence. And if we had gone into this 18 months ago knowing that we would maybe be pushing India closer to the Chinese, not, not, not to say nothing of Russia, we're pushing Russia and India closer to the Chinese, we're encouraging the creation of an entirely alternative financial system. It's really important that our law enforcement has access to some of these financial transactions. It's one of the ways we catch international crime. It's one of the ways that we prevent international terrorism. If the consequence of our Ukraine policy is weakening that financial system and strengthening an alternative financial system, I think it's one of the many consequences for our country that our policymakers haven't fully incorporated, uh, and frankly, that, that our, the American people are not fully aware of, because you don't see the effects of this stuff right away. We may be dealing with consequences for years or even decades to come, but I appreciate your work on this and appreciate your answer to the questions. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg, and thank you, thanks to everybody else. I yield. Thank you, Senator Vance. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fentanyl is fueling the most severe drug crisis our country has ever seen. In 2022, synthetic opioids like fentanyl were responsible for 75,000 deaths, more than two-thirds of all drug overdose deaths last year. Fentanyl is now the leading cause of death among Americans 18 to 45. China is the leading supplier of the chemical ingredients called precursors that drug cartels use to produce fentanyl and other synthetic opioids. China also plays a major role in laundering money for the cartels. Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, you are responsible for leading and coordinating anti-money laundering policy. Now, Treasury has caught a number of Chinese companies that were providing fentanyl precursors. Were any of these Chinese companies using cryptocurrency in their illegal drug transactions? Thank you, Senator, for the question. 
Unfortunately, uh, that is a mode that some of these uh, uh, precursor manufacturers and illicit drug uh, organizations have used, the receipt of Bitcoin payments in uh, wallets, cryptocurrency wallets. Okay, so we're talking about these Chinese companies that are supplying the precursors to fentanyl and they're getting paid in cryptocurrency. And you have to ask why this would happen because crypto is supposedly banned in China. But new research from the blockchain analytics firm Elliptic shows that more than 90 companies based in China are raking in tens of millions of dollars worth of crypto selling these fentanyl precursors. The number of crypto transactions associated with Chinese fentanyl brokers increased by 450% just last year alone. So Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, why are drug suppliers and cartels increasingly turning to crypto for large scale drug sales and money laundering? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, the, the reason why they would find this appealing is the same reason that other financial criminals would find it appealing, which is to say there's an element of pseudonymity they seek in using this kind of payment mechanism. Also, you're able to, unfortunately, process, unfortunately for these purposes, process a, lar a large number, a, a large value, financial value across Lots the border. Lots of dollars worth of Yes, of sure. Bitcoin in this instance, right? The, uh, a large amount of a high value of uh, such currency across a national border. And if you can achieve a person-to-person -person transaction or um, a decentralized transaction, then you're avoiding the kind of scrutiny, you know, your customer financial disclosure that you would get if you used a more traditional financial institution. So those anonymity-enhancing features are generally what financial criminals that you're noting here find attractive. Okay, so they're using crypto. This is their payment of choice for these fentanyl dealers. This is looking good for them. And it, it is one. one. Unfortunately, okay. there are others, but it is certainly but one. But this is, this is one that they're focused on here. So Elliptic's research found that these 90 Chinese suppliers sold enough. Let's talk about the volume. This group sold enough precursor drugs in exchange for crypto to produce $54 billion worth of fentanyl pills. That is enough fentanyl to kill nearly 9 billion people, all paid for by crypto. When one of the companies was asked whether their Mexico-based customers paid in crypto, they replied that the cartels, and I'm going to quote, always use Tether or Bitcoin to pay. It is no problem. Now, the Office of National Drug Control Policy has identified crypto as, quote, central to the rise of drug sales in the United States. Senator Marshall and I believe that Congress has talked about fentanyl long enough. We propose to do something to fight back, and that is why we are reintroducing our Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act, which closes loopholes in our anti-money laundering rules and cuts off drug suppliers and cartels from using crypto to fuel their illegal business. Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, will closing the holes in our anti-money laundering rules give regulators stronger tools to address crypto's use in the fentanyl trade and at least help cut off payments from drug cartels to Chinese drug suppliers? Yes, I'm certain that will help, and I hope that we will be able to encourage some of our foreign counterparts, other jurisdictions, to do the same, which would go a long way in helping as well. Thank you. Crypto is helping fund the fentanyl trade, and we have the power to shut that down. It's time. Thank you. Senator Brett from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. I am greatly concerned with the growing relationship between Iran and China. These two countries have long worked together, China purchasing Iranian oil and Iran buying Chinese goods. We've seen Chinese firms repeatedly caught in aiding Iran's missile production and different defenses. And we've also seen, as we've discussed here today, China uh, laying the foundation both for technology and infrastructure with Huawei in order for Iran to be able to surveil and censor their own people. 
I saw and heard um, in Mr. Axelrod's testimony that we must have robust partnerships, which I could not agree more with. I think China understands that as well, which is why I am so concerned uh, with regards to China's role in bringing Iran and Saudi Arabia together um, not too long ago. Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, despite intensified sanctions, Iran has continued to increase its oil exports, and China seems to be the largest beneficiary of that. What is the administration doing to stop Chinese purchase of Iranian oil and petroleum products? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I share this concern you're articulating about Iran being able to continue to sell petroleum and petrochemical or petroleum products. Uh, indeed, China is a purchaser of great concern and not just as a purchaser, but also facilitating trading activities, providing storage, so that, that broader supply chain. What we have been doing in response to this concern is getting out there to designate and clarify what is occurring that is of such great concern. So for example, uh, in a series of designations, different designation packages this year and last year, we went after dozens of Chinese recipients uh, also the providers of storage and of trading and brokering, not just Chinese individuals, by the way, also elsewhere in the region, including where that's part of a supply chain to China in order to get after and expose purchases of petroleum and petroleum products. So let me ask you this. Um, if ports or refineries are knowingly accepting shipments of oil from Iran, are they violating U.S. sanctions? Our, yes, our authorities say where there is a, a knowing a purchase right. of sig a significant purchase. Yes, so that's a yes. So if if so, have any Chinese ports or refineries actually been sanctioned? Um, uh, with regard to the specificity here, what we are doing is getting after nodes in that chain where we can have the biggest disruption effect. So that uh, it may not be the end. So the end recipient, uh, and it's often not a refiner. So do, do the sanctions allow if a port knowingly accepts it? So shouldn't we be actually pursuing this with these ports, these Chinese ports that are accepting this petroleum I, and oil products from Iran? Yeah, so uh, wherever there is an entity that is engaging in one such transaction, yes, it should okay, be so a target. We, but you were saying to date we have not we have not sanctioned any Chinese port or refinery. I did not say that, actually, and I'd be happy to follow up with you on the specific entities, but uh, it is our goal to find those where the disruptive- So we have sanctioned some. We have sanctioned many entities in China related to the, this trade. The port, though. I would be happy to follow up with you on specific entities in order to answer your question with detail. Okay, I would hope if they are knowingly accepting it, as you said, and it's within the realm that we're actually doing what we say we're going to do and following through um, with these sanctions. So my question to you is, if we have these sanctions in place, and yet Iranian oil exports hit new heights at the end of last year, and obviously we know that China's purchase of Iranian oil has risen to record levels, we are either, we don't have the right sanctions in place or we're not enforcing them. Would you agree? I think the authorities we have are strong and efficacious. I too have noted, along with my colleagues in the intelligence community, our colleagues in the intelligence community and throughout this government, that this is a growing concern. I never think that sanctions are the only tool that can advance our purposes here, but we must so not So what hesitate. else should we do then? Because we shouldn't have these sanctions in place. We're either, we don't have the right sanctions in place or we're not enforcing them. Or to your point, there's another tool that we're not using. So what is that? There's a variety of things that we must do, a number of which we are doing, in order to get at the supply chain. So, for example, where there are jurisdictions that are involved in the transshipment, those are further opportunities, including in the Gulf and in Southeast Asia, to engage with the leaders of those countries and businesses there in order to clarify for them the consequences of violating our sanctions. So that's a diplomatic and technical engagement, as well as sanctions designation with, for example, Malaysia. Well, and I'd like for us to just drill down into this. I know that I am out of time, but when we're seeing Iran offer discounted oil to compete with Russia and the Chinese marketplace and circumvent our sanctions regime um, in coordination with China, it's incredibly concerning. So it, it is my position that we either are not using the right sanctions or we are not enforcing them to the level that we can, and either one is not acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Uh, Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me jump back to uh, what I heard Assistant Secretary uh, Rosenberg talk about, the need to get some of our allies and other countries supportive of what we are trying to do here um, with respect to uh, the illicit activities that are happening. Um, and let, so let me start with this, because I know just in general, the, the malign neglect on the PRC's part has allowed money laundering to flourish. Um, and underwriting, it is really underwriting some of the drug trafficking in North America and fueling the probability of that drug trade. The PRC has made commitments, however, to crack down on illicit finance, yet it fails to investigate its own money laundering schemes and blocks other nations from doing so. So can I ask, what actions has Treasury taken, if any, or is it even possible, to secure the Chinese Communist Party's cooperation? with international investigations of illicit financial activity? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, this is a concern, just as you have noted, and uh, it's been a frustration, I think, to many in the US government that when Chinese entities have gone after the predicate crimes associated with uh, drug activity, illicit drug activity, to the extent they have done so, they are often not also going after the financial associated financial transactions to those. Uh, which is something that we have sought to engage Chinese counterparts uh, about in our concerns so that we can pursue those activities. They can pursue them, we can pursue them together. When I noted in my opening statement the value of engaging China to deal with areas of mutual concern, I noted a few. Another one of that list is cooperation on counter-narcotics efforts. So that is an excellent reason in my mind that we should have constructive and clear communication between our two countries to get at this problem where we clearly have a link between their supply and the recipients in our country, unfortunately. And that's right. And anybody who's ever worked in just on the federal law enforcement side knows you follow the money. You follow the money. That's the key to taking out a lot of the illicit activity, whether it's around drug trafficking or human trafficking, uh, what we see. And so Treasury plays an important role. And for that reason, let me talk about, because uh, as a Nevadan, I am deeply concerned about the easy access to, to fentanyl in our communities. And that's why I co-sponsored um, the Bipartisan Fend Off Fentanyl Act to crack down on transnational drug trafficking networks. Um, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, you said earlier in response to Senator Scott's question, what more uh, can you do? You talked a little bit about the need to extend the statute of limitations. And in the bill, it, it extends it to eight years, but you're seeking to extend it to 10 years. Can you explain why that's important for Treasury? Thank you for that uh, for that question. Uh, I would be happy to. And just to note, that would extend it in line with uh, similar authorities given to the SEC for, for pursuit of uh, enforcement activities. There are three key reasons why it would be useful to expand out to 10 years. The first of which is that um, and for anyone who has looked carefully at a complex web of this nature, where we're seeing these procurement networks and associated financial activity and money laundering activity, they're difficult, complicated to investigate. They involve multiple different fronts, beneficial owners in a variety of different jurisdictions, opaque corporate structures. So having the time to be able to put that together specifically including when they go across borders. And we're trying to work with, for example, the Mex our Mexican counterparts on the law enforcement side. Unfortunately, it just takes time, a lot of time, to do a complex investigation. That's one. The second one is that having to do with uh, compliance. Uh, so it will clearly signal, having a longer statute of limitations here, clearly signal to those covered institutions, covered entities that have an obligation here uh, and are watching AIPA restrictions to which they, that they must comply with, that they must comply for a longer period of time. That, that is to say, there is a, a longer uh, period that, uh, that they need to be looking at. Uh, and then the last one here, um, uh, deterrence is related to the same thing, which is to say, if there is a longer period here that they must be uh, aware of when they're thinking about violations, AIPA violations, it will deter them from uh, skating up to the edge or taking certain risks if they know that they um, may be uh, investigated and prosecuted uh, for that 10-year period. Thank you. Um, I, and I know my time is almost up, but I, I'm curious, and I'll submit this for the record, but as we talk about fentanyl, 
um, and we track its precursors and from China into Mexico into the United States, it, to me that is similar than, to the methamphetamine issue we had decades ago, where the precursors were coming from China into Mexico into the United States. And so I, I, at some point in time I'm curious, what have we learned or not learned? What tools do we need? And we should have a better understanding of how to track and stop fentanyl if we were doing so with uh, methamphetamine uh, decades ago. And it's a question for a later time for us to have a discussion, but I I'm always curious, what, what more do we need, tools do we need to give you? Or is it more of just a coordination of federal agencies and state and local agencies with some of our allies and partners? Uh, but uh, I know my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cortez. Uh, Senator Daines of Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Montana is not uh, exempt from the crisis we're seeing with uh, fentanyl and as well as what Senator Cortez Mass said, meth. Um, for the last 10 years, the United States has seen exponential increases in trafficking, interdiction, overdoses related to fentanyl. As we say, though, you don't necessarily die of an overdose of fentanyl. You die of exposure to fentanyl. You think about a little sweet and low packet. If that were fentanyl, is enough to kill 500 people. As you know, the trafficking and sale of drugs like these are made possible through advanced illicit finance schemes such as trade-based money laundering or obscured beneficial ownership. Um, talk about the supply chain, China, Mexico, into the United States. Uh, I spent six years living in China with Procter & Gamble, launching brands there. We had two kids born in Hong Kong. We, we were there to compete against the Chinese brands. By the way, we beat them handily. These great American high quality products competing then against Chinese brands. But the cost of these crimes cannot only be measured by Chinese subversion of US interests around the globe, but also in terms of American lives. Well, the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, with the help of the Corporate Transparency Act, have done excellent work to curb these behaviors. The simple fact is this, there's still a major concern for the US, international partners, and financial institutions around the world. More needs to be done to combat these illicit financial flows that impact everything from fentanyl to the acquisition of military end use technology. Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, fentanyl overdose deaths in Montana in the last two years are up 1,700%. We are a northern border state with a southern border crisis. The trafficking of fentanyl and its precursors is largely conducted or facilitated by Chinese actors. These Chinese networks can operate outside of designated local jurisdictions through the establishment of shell companies, which often serve as fronts for illicit activities. Beneficial ownership information is a critical part of uncovering these shell companies and combating drug trafficking. I have concerns about the direction the beneficial ownership rulemaking is taking. Ms. Rosenberg, how do you envision success when combating drug trafficking, particularly fentanyl trafficking, given the limited access to BOI? Thank you very much, Senator. Um, I, you've raised very significant challenges that we, uh, with which I would agree and that are uh, frustrating for us as we're thinking about how to see into the networks that are involved in both moving the drugs and in laundering the money associated with those drugs um, to all parts of the United States. I do believe that um, with these kinds of crimes, as with a whole host of other criminal financial activity, the ability to see into and understand the ultimate beneficial owner of uh, shell companies in the United States will help. It won't be the only thing that will help us because when we're dealing with structures uh, that uh, where even that information is not clear to us, uh, we'll still be struggling to put together the pieces. So it won't be just, unfortunately, I think that won't be the silver bullet for us, but it will be helpful. You can expand on that. Um, most financial institutions prefer to self-regulate. 
and avoid sanctions violations and any civil penalties associated with conducting businesses with bad actors. That's just good business practices. Would you agree that an active relationship with the private sector would be a multiplier for identifying and tracing illicit financial flows? I don't just agree. I think it's essential. It's absolutely essential for understanding. They are the ones that report to us suspicious activity reports, and they help us map together the indicators, the typologies that we can then generalize and reflect back publicly so that they can do their jobs even better. Uh, one more question for you, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg. As you know, many times the best way to trace the source of international crime and terrorism is to follow the financial footprint. Whether we're talking about illicit activity in South American free trade zones or shell corporations in Macau, how is the Corporate Transparency Act and the Greater Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 failing to provide the necessary tools to attack illicit financial flows? Senator, I think there are, there are a variety of different pieces that we'll need in order to understand the risk associated with criminal financial activity and address them effectively. So the, the authorities that were um, required per AMLA and the CTA in particular for beneficial ownership, that will go a long way towards one of our greatest vulnerabilities and deficiencies in this system, which is the anonymous companies problem. There are a variety of other challenges we see that we need to address. We had the opportunity to speak earlier in this hearing about investment advisors or the private wealth industry where there are uh, also vulnerabilities in our approach and our regulatory system. That is another area where we need to devote attention in order to be able to get at this broader challenge in front of us. Thank you. Chairman. Thanks. Uh, uh, Senator Van Hollen from Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your testimony and for your service. Um, in early January, President Biden uh, signed into law a bill I authored along with uh, former Senator Sass called the Protecting American Intellectual Property Act. And I want to thank the chairman for his help in uh, getting that passed. Uh, the idea was pretty straightforward, that garden variety litigation is often not a sufficient defense when you've got sophisticated foreign actors backed up by foreign governments uh, trying to steal uh, very important U.S. technologies. Um, exhibit A, of course, being the PRC. Uh, the president, as I understand it, has not yet designated the implementing agency. I recognize this falls among agencies. Can anybody provide an update today, and I'll start with uh, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, as to the, the, the status of the, the president's decision? I re the reason I want to emphasize this is the bill requires a report to be due uh, by later this month that, that identifies and designates uh, foreign entities uh, that are engaged in the serial theft of U.S. technology and to apply sanctions. So I'd be, um, I would welcome any um, update on where all that may stand. Thank you, Senator. I, too, understand that this um, uh, legislation has yet to be delegated by the president to a cabinet agency. That said, as you, uh, I'm sure, appreciate, IP theft is something that is that many of our agencies are focused on and interested in and where we already have some activity that we would be able to advance uh, further with uh, when this authority is delegated. No, I appreciate that. And uh, the idea was to give um, the U.S. government a little more firepower in helping uh, U.S. companies that are subjected to this kind of serial mm -hmm. theft of technology. Again, this is not intended to interfere with garden variety litigation in the courts, but there are, as you know, many examples over time uh, where especially um, Chinese entities backed by the PRC uh, have engaged in theft of U.S. technology. The idea here is to, to catch that early and preempt it. So I, I appreciate it. The report, as I said, is, is due in later, later in June. Um, so uh, I appreciate your looking into that. Uh, I, I do want to take this moment to, to commend um, all of you for your efforts uh, to identify critical technologies uh, to put on our export, ex export control list, um, especially those technologies like advanced semiconductors, uh, the equipment to manufacture 
advanced semiconductors. Uh, congratulations on the agreement we reached with the Netherlands and Japan uh, when it came to that advanced manufacturing equipment, uh, because I think that is essential. Um, obviously, it requires very good coordination uh, with our allies and others around the world, and I know that's been a theme of this, and I think all of you are very well aware of that fact, and I just want to urge you to continue to move in that direction. I think Secretary Yellen gave an important speech uh, at SICE. Uh, Secretary Raimondo has spoken about this. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, gave remarks at Brookings, um, the EU president. So I, I think this idea of, as I think I've heard it described, small gardens and high walls, in other words, really protect those technologies that are vital uh, to our national security. Um, so, but, and not cover a lot of things, but have very high walls. I do want to, in my closing uh, time here, though, ask about the issue of outbound CFIUS or outbound investment. Um, you know, I'm reading the statement here from the G7, uh, which reads, we recognize that appropriate measures designed to address risks from outbound investment could be important to complement complement uh, existing controls of targeted, uh, of targeted controls on exports and inbound investments, which together uh, protect se our sensitive technologies from being used in ways that threaten international peace and security. So that's the, the G7. Um, I understand it's a broad statement, but Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, could you just identify what principles we're going to be applying uh, as we decide how to implement uh, outbound investment controls. As you know, there's a, a, a lot of discussion and concern. The devil's in the details, and so I'm interested in your thoughts on that. And any other witnesses? Thank you, Senator. I'd be happy to defer to my uh, colleague, Assistant Secretary Rosen, to take that question. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator, for the question um, and, and highlighting the G7 statement. In fact, uh, international engagement has been a key component of our efforts, taking the time to get this right. Um, has been uh, one of our core principles, as well as engaging with various stakeholders and, and Congress as well. We are focused uh, when it comes to principles on national security. Uh, we are focused on a tailored, narrow, administrable, understandable approach that gets at these core equities that would clearly and directly impact U.S. national security in a way that's understandable to the community that's going to have to comply with them. Um, and, and, and in a way that um, directly enhances and protects our national security. And so, so those are some of the fundamental principles that we're focused on. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Kramer from North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all of our witnesses. It won't surprise you, um, Assistant Secretary Rosen, that I want to talk to you about the same topic that you visited with Senator Tester about. It, I, I will say, though, his emphasis on making sure you can enforce is it, we're not, was not unimportant. I, I think I want to give you the tools to do that first, but, but do hope, considering what you said to him about food security being a critical supply chain, um, that we would prioritize, prioritize that for sure, but we, we can get into that at another time. Specifically though, in relation to the legislation that you were talking about, the PASS Act, that he and, he and I and, and uh, Senator Rounds and others uh, are on, and some other legislation related specifically to the food supply chain. Um, do, you, do you believe that the role of the Secretary of Agriculture as a standing member would be helpful? Because one of the frustrations I saw from our vantage point during the, that last awful um, year of nightmare in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where Fu Fang had purchased the 370 acres near Grand Forks, some 12 miles from the from the uh, Grand Forks Air Force Base, and you also mentioned sensitive facilities in your in your statement, uh, your opening statement, as, as one of the criteria. That we were very frustrated that after CFIUS took the the first sixty plus another fifteen or so days to conclude that they didn't have jurisdiction, <laughs> it was very frustrating to watch that play out. Would it have helped? And 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 well, would it have helped to expand CFIUS? with the Secretary of Agriculture as a standing member so that food supply chain is, in fact, a, a higher priority. Well, thank you, Senator, for the question, for our continued dialogue yeah. on what is a very important issue. Um, and I'll repeat what I said to Senator Tester. Food security, particularly in the supply chain, is a critical national security issue. 
as you know, I can't talk about any particular case or comment on any particular mm -hmm. case. That said, I want to address um, your, your comment a bit more generally about USDA, if I may. Thank uh, you. Um, so uh, USDA is a critical um, ally and partner in CFIUS. And the way the, that we, given the importance around these food security issues that we've talked about, we have set up a process where USDA has full visibility into the case filings. They have visibility into the materials. They're regularly involved in our regular CFIUS meetings. And they have an opportunity to not just participate, but lead, just like a permanent member would, um, cases that present specific food security or agricultural issues. And when they do that, they are participating by and large just like a full member. So the process that we have set up ensures from my perspective that we do not leave any uh, food security or agricultural issues as it relates to national security unresolved. And so that's how we are working with them presently. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the obvious secrecy um, with specific cases, but if, if the secretary and, and the department can have access in the meantime, if we could pass legislation that would codify that, I think that would probably strengthen your hand a little bit. Um, just sort of building on that, and you used the term, again, sensitive facilities, and I'm quite certain I'm not saying anything that's classified, but as, as you know, it was quite public last month when the administration or the Department of Defense added eight military bases to, to receive broader jurisdiction or provide broader jurisdiction for CFIUS, um, given the sensitivity of, of the bases. Are you, I suspect this is basically a call by the Department of Defense, but would you have suggestions on, on whether we should just more broadly uh, add all military bases um, to this jurisdiction? Because it seems to me that if we start designating certain bases as more sensitive than other bases, we might, in essence, be signaling to the enemy what, 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 where our priorities are. I mean, wouldn't it make sense to just apply that more broadly to all of our military and defense installations? Senator, thank you for that question and for your support in that expansion. That, uh, yeah, my insistence in working with the DOD, we did start the regulatory process for adding those eight bases, added 300,000 square miles of additional real estate coverage. The way that Congress set up our authorizing statute and FIRMA was mm -hmm. very intentional not to blanket the United States right. with real estate jurisdiction. And we give great deference to our partners at the Department of Defense and elsewhere to designate for us sure. what is sort of a proximity risk. But um, these are certainly important questions. They're hard questions, and I'm happy to continue working with you. On I that. might just wrap up with this question. You can either answer it or not. But with, when it comes to land itself, um, whether it's agriculture or otherwise, it's not like we're going to grow more unless we're going to, you know, I don't think we're going to take over Alberta or anything, but it just it just seems like it's such a precious commodity that maybe we, you know, can, should just consider more restrictions, uh, more blanketed restrictions, but just my thought, my comment, I'm not even overly committed to it. It's just something to think about. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you for your help. Thank you. Uh, Senator Smith of Minnesota is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, thanks to all of our panelists. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a question first of uh, um, Secretary Rosenberg, um, this is around illicit finance risks with crypto. I know several of my colleagues have touched on this a little bit before. So China banned cryptocurrency trading about two years ago, um, but it appears that some of these restrictions aren't really working. Bank filings of the failed crypto exchange FTX show that 8% of its 9 million users were from China. Um, and there have also been reports alleging how um, employees of the exchange Binance and trained volunteers were teaching Chinese users how to evade the ban, including bypassing its own know your customer and residency verification systems. So Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, to what extent do you think that these bad actors in China are export, e exploiting um, these weaknesses to engage in money laundering or other illicit um, activities? And how, do we, how are we able to monitor or understand that risk? Thank you, Senator, for the question. One, I uh, appreciate the points that you've made. We're also quite concerned about jurisdictions, not just China, but other ones where even if there is ostensibly a policy that bans certain kinds of activity for their uh, for their uh, uh, for their nationals, they are nevertheless still involved in such activity. There are, as I noted, there are other jurisdictions where this is a problem. For us in the United States, one of our greatest vulnerabilities with respect to virtual assets is when other jurisdictions insufficiently put in place requirements, laws, rules, regulations, disclosure, and 
insufficiently enforce them mm -hmm. because where there is where that creates an opportunity for a lot of activity in the dark or outside of uh, awareness from their uh, regulators, including specifically where countries say it shall not be allowed, but nevertheless it's clearly happening. That is because that doesn't give them an opportunity to work with us right. on enforcing against activity that may cross borders and violate our laws. And do you have thoughts? What are your thoughts about um, how regulators or Congress can, you know, address this, you know, apparent ease with which crypto users can work around these trading restrictions? I mean, what should we be doing more of or differently? Well, to the point that I was just making, where that greatest vulnerability of ours is when other jurisdictions have inadequate rules and enforce against them, mm -hmm. I think that the American people would be very well served if we together with one voice made quite clear to other jurisdictions that have inadequate regulatory structures and inadequately enforced that they must step up to the plate because their weakness leaves us all vulnerable. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let me turn to um, um, Ms. Kendler. Um, Assistant Secretary Kendler, we are aware of how the Chinese, uh, the, the um, People's Republic of China military civil fusion strategy creates unique obstacles when we're trying to restrict export of technologies that have dual use, making it, you know, it's hard to um, identify what that technology's end users are and end uses are. Um, so it, this you know, robust enforcement of these export controls is important for our national security, but it's complicated. So could you talk a bit about what trends you are seeing in attempts to evade dual-use technology export controls? Um, how should we be partnering and working with agencies to mitigate that risk for dual-use technologies that might be diverted to Chinese, China's military capacities? Thank you, Senator. We, we share your concerns about PRC uh, procurement strategies that are directed at its military modernization and human rights abuses. Uh, from the licensing uh, perspective, and, and I'll defer to my, my colleague, mm -hmm. uh, Assistant Secretary Axelrod, when it comes to the enforcement and evasion issues. From a licensing perspective, we pursue two pillars, really. One is based on technology identification, restricting cutting edge technologies in a calibrated way for the PRC, and then also looking at entities that are of specific military modernization concern, uh, national security and foreign policy concern, and that's how the basis for our structure. That's great, thank you. And um, uh, Mr. Axelrod, please. Yeah, thank you, Senator. There's, there's no higher priority for us than combating that threat. It's one of the reasons why we stood up the Disruptive Technology Strike Force, which I co-lead along with my counterpart at the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, it's 14 operational cells around the country focused on preventing sensitive technology from going to places of concern, including China. We rolled out the three, first five actions of that uh, strike force just a couple weeks ago, and three were related to, to the PRC. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Lemos from Wyoming is recognized, and Senator Smith will chair the committee for the remainder of 15 or 20 minutes. Senator Lemos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Ro Rosenberg, uh, I, I think it's very important that we ensure digital assets are not being used for illicit finance. Um, so the Lemus Gillibrand uh, Financial Innovation Act will be reintroduced soon, uh, and it will include an, an entirely new title on combating illicit finance. My first question is, do you agree that digital assets today are subject to the U.S. comprehensive laws on money laundering and sanctions. Thank you, uh, Senator, for um, for this question, and I uh, appreciate the the focus, the legislative focus. We'd be happy to work with you going forward. Um, it is certainly true that financial institutions that um, uh, offer services in the digital asset domain are covered by AML CFT obligations. Thank you. Uh, my next question also for you is from a practical standpoint in combating money laundering and sanctions evasions in digital assets, would you rather have new legal authorities or new personnel and funding to equip Treasury to fight bad actors in the digital asset space? Thank you, Senator. I'm very grateful for that, that kind of a question. Um, uh, 
with respect to the, the first part of it on legal authorities, I would really welcome the opportunity to work with you in order to, it, it would depend on what they are, and I would welcome the opportunity to work with you on what they are. When it comes to additional bodies and additional resources to get after this problem that I, I think you and others on this committee, certainly in our agency, acknowledge is a challenge and a problem, uh, we can do more with more and would welcome the opportunity to get after this problem with more resources. Well, I'll make sure that when Senator Gillibrand and I are, are working our bill through the system that we stay in touch with you. Um, Ms. Kendler, I want to turn to you. Uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security monitors the export of advanced technologies so they don't end up in the wrong hands. But you don't currently regulate the export of Americans' personal data to our adversaries like China. As a result, there are no rules outlawing the sale of data on sensitive topics, including information on military and intelligence personnel to the Chinese government. Do you agree that personal data on Americans, particularly our servicemen and women, can be exploited by foreign adversaries in ways that are harmful to national security? Senator, I do share your overall concerns about this issue. Uh, uh, the uh, approach of export controls has been on goods, software, and technology, not on personal, personal identifiable information. Uh, but, but I do share your concerns, yes. Well, thanks for that answer. I, too, am concerned about the national security threat posed by the export of Americans' personal data. Um, so I'm co-leading with uh, Ron Wyden, an important bipartisan bill, the Protecting Americans' Data from Foreign Surveillance Act. And I'm joining Senators Wyden, Haggerty, and Rubio. So this is very bipartisan, includes other members of this committee. And I look forward to working with all my colleagues on this committee and off uh, on strengthening US competitiveness against China in digital assets distributed ledger technologies, which are beginning to really blossom in terms of the capabilities of using uh, distributed ledger technology and data exports. It's a growing area of interest, it's a growing area of concern, and it's certainly uh, a growing technology that we all need to be aware of. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Senator Warnock. Thank you so very much, Madam Chair. Uh, in 1919, President Woodrow Wilson described sanctions as an act that does not require force and would not, quote, he said, cost a life outside of the nation boycotted. Um, more than 100 years later, we, we know that the truth is more complicated than that. We know that this tool, although peaceful, in that it does not rely on the use of guns or bombs, still has severe consequences and can have a devastating effect on societies. In our globalized and connected world, sanctions on one nation usually affect others. Sanctions on a global economy like China, for example, would likely affect folks all around the world. And we know that these effects can last for generations. Uh, Ms. Rosenberg, how do you measure the effectiveness of sanctions in targeting decision makers and the ruling groups of nations? Thank you, Senator, for that question. In, in measuring effectiveness, I think it's utterly essential to define the objectives against which you're measuring those, those particular sanctions. So, uh, for example, with respect to our Russia sanctions, we've sought to do two things in particular, to deprive, <clears throat> excuse me, to deprive Russia of the money and financial funds and also of the battlefield equipment that it needs in order to fight its war. That is different than saying a goal would be to collapse an entire economy. We're quite focused. And so when evaluating the efficacy of these sanctions, you must measure it against what your goals are in the first instance. Now, one of the reasons why it's useful to have partnership with members of Congress and the administration is so that we can discuss together the goals of various uh, sanctions authorities so that we can be aligned and working with common purpose. And then 
evaluating their efficacy against the objectives we have set out together. So a, a, a kind of laser focus on the goal so as not to create consequences that cascade beyond what you're trying to do. Um, at the same time, uh, even, even with that kind of focus, with the world being so connected, uh, there is the concern that this affects poor and working class folks in, in other countries, uh, particularly with a global economy like China. How, how do you take all of that in, into account as you think about this? Not just those concerns you mentioned, but other ones too that we must all be concerned with, like competitiveness of, of, of American businesses and institutions sure. uh, and our ability to innovate and promote growth in our country and of course those in our allies. These are exactly the right questions and I think as sanctions policymakers, we must constantly be asking ourselves every time we implement a new sanction, will this have the desired purpose? Will it have unintended consequences? And seek to mitigate those unintended consequences at every step before, during, if it occurs afterwards to try and address them. We do that often using licensing or updating the authority. Ms. Kendler, can you speak to how you think about this or considerations that, that you take into account? Yes, Senator, I agree with your, your focus on these issues and share your concerns. When we impose export controls, we do so in a very calibrated and targeted way. For example, the uh, advanced computing rule we put in place last October was, was focused on the most cutting edge of technologies. Uh, so as not to uh, disrupt legacy technologies that, that have limited national security purpose. Our focus was on the cutting edge technologies that would most affect national security um, because of their use in artificial intelligence and supercomputing. Thank you so much. We have to carefully consider innocent families and children and those without power when we use these tools, very, very powerful tools. Um, the Commerce Department recently announced a collaboration with the FBI, the FBI and the Department of Justice, a disruptive technology strike force to target illicit acquisition of technology assets by foreign adversaries like the Chinese government. This seems to follow in the footsteps of the Department of Justice's, quote, China initiative in 2018 to address potential economic espionage. DOJ ended that initiative, as you know, in 2021 following criticism from civil rights groups that it targeted scientists of Chinese descent and produced several prosecutions that actually ended in dismissals or acquisitions. As DOJ officials acknowledged, the department heard from members of the scientific community that targeting scientists over sometimes minor research grant infractions could, quote, lead to a chilling atmosphere for scientists and scholars that damages the scientific enterprise in our country I've been hearing from a lot of folks uh, in my state uh, on this, Georgians of Chinese descent, including scientific researchers at some of our universities, about the climate of fear around any engagement with China, even lawful interaction. Mr. Uh, Axelrod, as commerce begins this new initiative to target espionage by the Chinese government, which is a serious threat, which we, we have to engage, what steps have you taken to address civil rights concerns and any actual or perceived targeting of scientists of Chinese descent? Yeah, thank you for the question, Senator, because you've hit on uh, two critically important things. One is to um, take action against the threat from the PRC, which is why we've established the Disruptive Technology Strike Force with the Department of Justice. Um, and then a second is to make sure that Chinese Americans or um, people of Chinese descent who are here studying or working in the United States uh, are not targeted and do not feel targeted. Um, and I believe one thing we've done in that regard, separate from the strike force, which is really more focused on things happening in PRC, um, is our establishment of an academic outreach initiative. Um, because in the academic community in particular, it is essential that we both safeguard um, sensitive research but also at the same time maintain that open collaborative environment so that we have people from foreign countries coming here to 
help um, contribute to the research and development that is, that is sort of the hallmark of our academic setting. And so we've worked, uh, we identified 20 universities in particular that we thought were maybe at higher risk from, um, from foreign, foreign countries, and we are working with them and partnering with them to what's on really a shared endeavor, which is to protect their research community um, and protect their research from forces abroad that would seek to, seek to obtain it. Thank I have you. much more here, but thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Warnock. Senator Fetterman. Thank you, Madam Chief, uh, Chair. Uh, hi. United States businesses have made large investments in high-tech companies ties to the CCP. Is that a fair statement? Uh, there has been foreign, there has been U.S. investment in PRC businesses, yes, Senator. In, in the, the CC, okay. Uh, and we, we need more increased scrutiny on these types of investments to protect our supply chains and our national security in, interests. My friend and my, my colleague, Senator Bob Casey, has spoke on that, that issue a lot. Are you familiar with any of that? Because the, the officials in the Biden administration have, uh, have outspoken about potential e executive order to outboard, abound, excuse me, investment screening. You know, Mr. Ray Rosen, can you speak about how transparent the U.S. companies and investments in CCP companies can promote a U.S. national security and de-risk our econ economic relationship with China? Yes, Senator Fetterman, thank you for raising uh, that important issue and, and understand uh, the question. Um, it is certainly the administration's goal um, to, um, uh, to get at the U.S. investment dollars that is coupled with particular expertise and know-how to make um, uh, certain uh, the development and advancement of certain specific uh, cutting-edge technologies, for instance, in artificial intelligence and semiconductors and quantum computing um, to help advance the development of those in ways that could negatively impact U.S. national security. It's something that the administration has been uh, working on for some time uh, because we want to get it right and we want to be careful. And we've also been engaged with um, the Senate and, and um, the leadership of that legislation, as you have identified, because we want to work with Congress as we move forward. Okay, sir. Well, cleaning on, uh, clearing on that, uh, sir, what resources does the administration need to on this front? Could you share any updates on the timeline on the release of the executive order on this? Thank you, Senator. Well, what I can say is um, um, as we work to develop it, I'm happy to keep you and the rest of this body updated in terms of the resources that we would need to be effective and appreciate the support that's already been uh, expressed uh, by the Senate and by members um, for our efforts in that regard. Uh, with regard to timelines, what I can say is that we are working um, quickly but diligently, um, and we are uh, working with um, not just uh, stakeholders in the United States government, but also external stakeholders um, in private industry, in Congress, our allies, because we want to ensure that um, if and when we do something in this area, that it is targeted and tailored, but also takes into account any potential unintended consequences. And so. Um, obviously, the ultimate decision is up to the president, but we're working um, hard on that. Okay, thank, thank you. And, and I see I see the balance to the chairwoman. Thank you so much, Senator Fetterman. Well, thank you to our witnesses for being here today and for providing testimony. For senators who wish to submit questions for the record, those questions will be due one week from today on June 7th. To the witnesses, you have 45 days to respond to any questions. Thank you again. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.